Late last spring, there appeared under the imprint of Random House in New York a book of, that has been of such timely significance that the New York Times devoted to it an extensive no article in its news columns at that time. And no wonder, for the book titled Flight and Rescue, written by Dr. Yehuda Bauer of the Hebrew University, reveals rather sensational aspects of a relatively unknown phase in Jewish history, the organized escape, namely, of the Jewish survivors from Eastern Europe to Palestine during the years 1944 through 1948. This is the period of the so-called Bricha, which means light, and which also has become the code word for that far-flung underground organization that so daringly and so ingeniously initiated and carried through an operation that moved about 300,000 men, women, and children from those hell holes that had been left of Jewish life in Eastern and Central Europe to Palestine. Illegal they were, and they were truly in flight before a combine of protectors and pursuers. The protectors, so to speak, were the Allied occupation forces in Europe after the war. They were protecting a newly created status quo of transitory homelessness left to the improvisations of a hopelessly helpless Western statesmanship and epitomized by the so-called DP camps, the displaced person camps in Europe. Those illegals were in flight before their pursuers, namely the British, the delinquent custodians of the mandate over Palestine, who now, after the liberation of the Jews of Europe, were mounting a regular warfare campaign with their army and navy against that hapless remnant of our people that was pounding at the gates of Palestine. And all this makes for a tragic, though fascinating reading of recent Jewish history, and the Jewish community all over the world is indebted indeed to Dr. Moshe David, the head of the Institute of Contemporary Jewry at the Hebrew University, for having made accessible to common knowledge that sorrowful, sometimes sordid, and often exhilarating story, which in the end turned anguish anguished flight into blessed rescue. For it was upon Dr. Davis' initiative that this Institute for Contemporary Jewry embarked upon a large-scale, laborious, and truly luminous effort to piece together this highly fragmented and widely ramified story and to publish it. And for such a purpose, Dr. Davies found a most competent scholar and writer, Dr. Yehuda Bauer, a member of the Institute staff. And for the purpose of making, making this book available to the English-speaking world, Dr. Davies succeeded in winning the understanding and participation of a prominent American publisher. Random House has then released some months ago, this book, which is indeed required reading for anyone who is interested to grasp those processes which make for one of the most exciting periods in the chron recent chronicles of the Jewish people, 
and at last but not least, furnished by themselves indispensable background history for the establishment of the State of Israel. And this is what the book is all about, and just let me flash a copy in front of you so that you may have an idea what this book, look like, book looks like, and it is available in all better bookstores and in public libraries, I hope, too. And if it is not, just ask the librarian to order it for yourself. But now some figures will step out of the pages of this book to relate some of the experiences that are either recorded there or alluded to. Happily, we uh, sh shall be able to call tonight on eyewitnesses to history, and even more on people who have helped to make history. And let's begin with Mr. Gaynor I. Jacobson, who headed then the Prague office of the American Joint Distribution Committee, who was, as the book says, the chief negotiator for the transit through Czechoslovakia with the Czech authorities, and most notably among them, I say this in parentheses, was the late Jan Mazarik, the foreign minister, and to con continue with a quotation, and on whose staff most of the Bricha commandos either worked or were registered. Those were for Mr. Jacobson days and weeks and months of continuing high drama, as we shall hear from him very soon. But the Prague interlude meant only one way station on Mr. Jacobson's exciting and colorful career that saw him play a leading part also in the joint operations in Italy in Greece and in Hungary that led him later to direct the operations of the Hayas in Latin America, in Europe, and in North Africa. And that has now found its current climax in the position of Executive Director of the United Hayas Service, where he is in overall charge of that organization's work, truly spanning the globe, and to be more precise, encompassing no less than some 40-odd countries. Let me add that Mr. Jacobson is also now the Vice Chairman of the American Council of Voluntary Agencies for Foreign Service and an Officer of the Refugee and Migration Problems Committee. His has been a lifetime assignment of rescue, indeed, of great achievements and of great dedication to our people. And now, let him reach back into his memories of the Bricha period. And let him tell us something, some of his salient experiences. Thus, it is really a great pleasure and personal privilege to be present to you for his recall of things past but never to be forgotten, the Executive Director of the United Higher Service, Mr. Gaynor I. Jacobs. Thank you, Dr. <coughs> Lehman, for that very flattering introduction. Uh, my forehand, Mr. Strobe, Mr. Block, Ladies and gentlemen, I should really uh, give you one sentence, namely, please read Dr. Yehuda Bauer's book, then I should sit down and wait for you to ask questions. But uh, I don't think I dare do that because Dr. Lehman has said I must stand up here 20 minutes. Now, in that 20 minutes, I'm supposed to relate to you something of the history of the dramatic history of our people 
During the period 1944-48, and all I can do is give you a little thumbnail sketch. 1944 saw the Joint Distribution Committee recruiting some Americans to go to Europe. Two Americans happened to be the brother of Jacob Trobe, Hillary Trobe, and myself. I went on late 44 to Italy. There, to work with our minuscule joint setup, but to work primarily with a marvelous group of men who were the Jewish Brigade, men from Palestine, who were there in Italy as part of the British Army, and who found ways and means of helping to rescue hundreds of Jewish children, Jewish men and women from behind the lines in North Italy and wherever we could get to them. And the process began of establishing Jewish camps in South Italy, Jewish children's homes, and then in February 1944, we were lucky. We managed to get our hands on 900 certificates, and we helped to load a boat from Bari, Italy, with 900 Jewish men, women, and children. This was February 45. In March, I was on my way to the little war-torn country of Greece, there to establish joint relief and rehabilitation program for the Greek Jews. And in the thumbnail, you know you know that there were some 75, 80,000 Greek Jews prior to Hitler, and you know that 12,000 survived. But there in Greece, it was my great privilege to meet with the number two man of the Bricha, of the Mossad. He's known today as Abriel. He was then Abut Ibarak. He was there with an, another Palestinian, known then as Chernowitz, today as Sur, was a distinguished ambassador later in the Argentine and France and is president of the Jewish National Fund. They came in from Turkey, and in addition to helping establish children's homes and getting little Greek communities going and seeing that people could get something to eat and live, Boats had to go off, and they went off with children. One boat was 500 children. A little boat, sometimes they irritated us because they called them kites. That was the name. It didn't refer to uh, the vernacular. At that time was the first time that I began to be the guest of the British Secret Police. Uh, Secret Service. They assigned various people to wine and dine me in an effort to find out when were these boats going off to Palestine from Greece. I think I have a beautiful art book at home still that was presented to me by one of these uh, British agents. This is a long history that went on to uh, throughout this period where the British did everything to assign people to be my friends, as well as to uh, ask governments to expel me, uh, because they thought that I was truly the Mossad, the Bricha, and because I was friendly and cooperative, shall we say. Uh, in uh, Czechoslovakia, where I went next, and the timing of that is March 1946. I followed, actually, Mr. Trobe's brother there. 
here a new panorama developed, something that I think uh, older Jews my age I never forget, but unfortunately we're not able to get it across to the younger generation of Jews. The whole, not just the Hitler experience, but the whole experience of Jews in Eastern Europe that sort of ties in when some of us get excited about people of the new left going to Jordan to help the Fedayim. I think now, and in the time allotted, I can only pull out a few little incidents. Prior to the infamous Kilsa pogrom in July 46, I rushed off in a jeep to the furthest eastern corner of Czechoslovakia, a town called Humany. And the reason for rushing off there was the following. The Banderovtsi, the Ukrainian-Polish fascist army, were, who had been committing pogroms in various towns in Poland, now this is 1946, had come down near Humany. There was a little Jewish community there. They were on the hills outside of Humany. You could see the campfires of the Banderovtsi. And they had a reputation, this was the right wing, the ultra-right wing, of killing whatever Jews they could wherever they got them. And I actually arrived in Humany with the idea of asking this little Jewish community, did they want us to take them out of Humany and bring them in for the West? Uh, maybe as far as Bratislava, to, to save their lives. Well, I must say this, that uh, the men, women, and children met with me and with my uh, Slovak-speaking colleague, and they decided, no, they would stay with the rest of the people, they would fight, they would risk their lives. Uh, I was in no position to pass judgment one way or the other. On the way back, I stopped in a town, and any of you who know that part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire may, may, may think of these communities. I stopped in a town called Preshov, which had a communist town mayor. And as I come there, and I'm wearing a, an American outfit, I'm met by a long delegation of Jewish men, middle-aged men, and they start to tell me their story. The story they tell me is of their sons. Their sons had been the best partisan fighters in the Tatra Mountains against the Germans and against the Slovak Nazis under Monsignor Tiso. They had fought all during this period. What happened was that two weeks before the Russians moved into Slovakia, a lot of Slovaks became partisans. Some sincerely, and some because it was two weeks before the Russians were coming. And they wanted to make sure that their records would be clean. What happened in the two weeks was the new partisans shot in the back hundreds of Jewish partisans who had been fighting in the mountains against the Nazis all during the war period. And the trouble is nobody knew who did this. And these fathers came with tears wanting justice from me. I was there alone in my jeep. I couldn't believe them. I went to the mayor of this town, Freshaw, communist of his council, and he said regretfully he had to admit this was true. But what could you do? But you could understand that a year later, on May 1st, in the capital of Slovakia, Bratislava, when the Red Partisans marched, they yelled anti-Semitic slogans. And you could tie in some of these things. 
then to talk to you about Kilsip, July 1946, the mass murder of Jews, some 46 Jews in that little town of Poland. To tell you, that was just one of a number of towns. I don't want to repeat to you what was in the press. You know what Arch, what the Cardinal Juan, the Polish Cardinal, said. It was the fault of the Jews because uh, they weren't uh, enough anti-communist that, uh, that, that the Poles were suffering too. And he refused to take a position against, at that time, against anti-Semitism, even. What went on in the different Polish communities, and I'm trying now to give you a flavor of what the Jews who were in hiding in Poland, what the 200 odd thousand Jews who managed to survive by going into Soviet Russia and came back into Poland met. And unless you understand their feelings, Let me give you another little incident. This is October 1946. I'm in Warsaw on a brief visit. And I meet the Grand Rabbi of Warsaw. And I'm surprised. This, this is a Prague, but I, I keep looking at Rabbi Koran when I uh, see this. Uh, say this. And I say to him, you know, the Grand Rabbi of the Orthodox community of Warsaw, there was one then, there still, yet reconstructed, how is it you are smooth shaven? And he explains to me, with difficulty, that the only housing he has for his wife and he has little children is on the outskirts of Warsaw. And he's a Jew when he comes to the synagogue in the center of town. But when he gets out to where he lives, he's no longer a Jew. And at that time, he was not letting his children know they were Jews. Because he said their classmates might murder them. This is October 1946. So that when... The Jews from Eastern Europe poured in either to Germany directly, to Stettin and onto Berlin, or the 150,000 who poured in when I was in Czechoslovakia, mainly through two little communities in Czech land, Nachod and Bromo. When they poured in, this got across to me something that it seems that there's always been great confusion and there's confusion today. People think you organize immigration of Jews. The wonderful Israelis and the wonderful Czech Slovaks and Poles who served as the Rika the people on the border point, the people who guided these people. They were there to regulate, to guide. They could do very little to stimulate. Idealistic Jews who are motivated to immigrate, immigrate, if they're so motivated. You go all over this world, as I do, and you meet wonderful Zionists, for some reason are still living in the Galut. But when Jews leave their homes, when Jews leave the cemeteries of their, of their beloved parents, grandparents, generations of them, when they leave everything they have, and they go over mountains, and they cross rivers, and they come out, this is not something that is organized. This is not something that is brainwashed. This is something they do because they have to do it. They do because they want to do it. Now, I'm not going into the whole 
panorama of what took place in hiding in the partisan unit in the ghetto of Warsaw in the concentration camps in the Soviet Union and what kind of beliefs Zionist and other types of beliefs were necessary to the survival of a person I don't have to tell anybody in this room I believe that when you're facing danger when you are ill all you have to do to die is to lose the desire to live and the illness gains or you lose the desire to struggle the, the interior forces of each Jew his belief in his belief is his, his feeling that he has a homeland he should have a homeland all of these things that go in to the things that end up with him belonging to different groups these are the things that help these people survive and as they pour helped our people survive and as they poured out of Poland and as they poured out of Subcarpathia and as they poured out of parts of Hungary and Romania in through Czechoslovakia when I was there this was a matter this was a matter of being helpful of guiding them there was a time when the most we could do was to keep people back across the border so that not too many arrived to hold them back now negotiations they have about seven more minutes negotiations people probably the single non-jew I knew in all the countries I've ever worked in who seemed genuinely interested in being helpful to our people was Jan Masaryk I say that because as I talked to him about what was going on in Poland and as I talked to him about what was going on at the borders Yen decided and it's now a matter of historical record that unless the Czechoslovak government continued to be helpful to these Jews who were flowing in from Eastern Europe he would not serve in the cabinet of that government his resignation was on the table recorded in the book we discussed this with them this was be this was when he was very necessary to that government Yan the wonderful sweet wise man now you must remember as the book points out these Jews were supposed to be displaced persons and a friend of ours an English friend of ours who's still in refugee work called Elton Reed World Council of Churches but who is <coughs> uh, who was then part of the UNRWA had tried to commit UNRWA to meet the bills of the Czechoslovak government in feeding and transporting these Jews from the borders of Poland through the Bratislava on to Austria bills that totaled in more than a million dollars and unfortunately UNRWA refused to pay those bills and at that time the Joint Distribution Committee trying to cope with the problems of Jews all over the European post-war world did not have the funds to pay it either the most we could do was to supplement despite the lack of payment Yan saw to it and from him certain other men in the government he had me talk with Clementis who was later foreign minister then the communist deputy foreign minister he had me deal with 
the head of the security police, a man who uh, my wife helped charm, called Toman, who controlled the borders of that country, and uh, who could turn the gates off or on. I tried with Swansky. You remember the famous Swansky who later was killed as a Zionist agent, who refused to cooperate in the least. And yet when the trials occurred, he died as a so-called Zionist agent. The, the work of helping the Jews in Eastern Europe at a time, again, the Polish communist government was too weak to maintain order, if they really wanted to maintain order. The forces of the extreme right, the fascist groups in Poland, were such that everything they had known prior to Hitler plus what they learned from Hitler became the law, especially when it came to killing Jews. The veneer of civilization that exists, well, I'm not going to talk to you about extremist groups in this country, but extremist groups in Eastern Europe, right or left, when they, when the lid is up and they can wreak havoc amongst Jews, we all forget the hundreds of Jews that were lynched in Poland after World War II, in the period I'm talking about. God forbid if we were talking about one-tenth of that number of blacks over a historical period, many more than that, every liberal Jew would, would, would want to do everything possible to save them, and we should. But these were our people. Now, in this process, I keep telling you about, as your chairman said, some of the negotiations, Masaryk, Clementis, Toman, Slansky, I could mention nakedly the Minister of Education and Social Welfare. I could go on and on and on. Scott Wall, last president of uh, the country, head of the Communist Party, and so forth. All of these negotiations were important at certain levels, but it would be the height of chutzpah for me to stand before you and to say that these were most important or more important, what was important were the men, the dedicated men of the Bricha, the men from the Jewish Brigade, the men from Palestine, the men from all of the East European countries who dedicated their lives and their efforts to helping to bring guide these Jews safely to their destination. And what were those destinations? The destination was a Rothschild hospital in Vienna and hopefully a camp in Austria, or going through Oss and on into DP camps in Germany, where then the people could sweat out what was taking place between Britain, the United States, the United Nations, and whether they would ever have a right, most of them, to achieve their goal of living and building their lives in Palestine then. Now, these people, I uh, want to repeat, Shaul Abigur, the brother-in-law of Sharet, the former Prime Minister of Israel. Shaul Abadur, who today still is a consultant on rescue activities for the government of Israel. Ehud Avriel, chairman 
of the Executive Committee of the World Zionist Congress, distinguished Israeli diplomat, great friend of mine, who was number two in the outfit. <coughs> A man named Circus, who's chairman of the security committee of the Knesset, incidentally chairman of the United Highest Committee of Israel, uh, uh, Circus, who was the head of the Bricha in Europe until it was turned over to a wonderful human being called Ephraim Dekel, who was the uh, former fire commissioner of Tel Aviv and the head of security for the Haganah. I can tell you these things because they're in the book. I, I couldn't uh, tell them to my closest friends before this because until they were in the book, they should have been top secret. Now, there are other people that are not mentioned in this book. Some of those people, Mr. Trobe and I know, his brother and I know definitely, and they can't be mentioned because unfortunately or fortunately for the Jewish people, they are still carrying on their fantastic work of rescue in countries that shall remain nameless. But one day, despite this wonderful book, other books must be written to supplement this and to, to add the dimensions. We have a man here rabbi forehand who worked with us and was central in helping thousands of yeshiva students and rabbis who came to Prague and who had to get out of Czechoslovakia and had to be helped by the joint and by his skillful contacts with the government. He happens to be here tonight. I'm very pleased that Rabbi Forehand is here. When I think that just one of those groups are the, were the world-famous Rabbi Schneerson and the Lubavitcher. And when I think of uh, I, a, an American Jew of not very good religious background in terms of understanding these things, and I'll never forget having all of these wonderful, wonderful religious leaders of our people like Schneerson and the Lubavitcher and other groups and taking care of them outside of Prague, and I just blithely went ahead and asked the Mizrahi to set up the kitchen for these people. I'll never forget this. Assuming, my way of thinking, the Mizrahi were orthodox, they could handle it. And the delegations I got, partially organized by Rabbi Foran, I'm sure, who came and said, did I want those, ortho those reformed Jews with Mizrahi handling the kitchen for them? They had drop kosher and... And it had to be arranged differently, so we had to have kosher kitchens of uh, different styles. Well, the story of the rescue of our Jews is one I wish I could stand here for hours, talk back and forth. I can't. All I can do is to thank your chairman, to thank you, the Bauer, like he did, and Moshe Davis, for having put a little bit of a very complicated and very wonderful story of our people in the pages of that book. And uh, I've exceeded my time limit by two minutes, and I thank you for listening. Well, Mr. Jacobson spoke quietly and movingly, but those stormy days came to life Again, Mr. Jacobson's vivid uh, presentation, uh, spiced with so, so much illuminating uh, detail. I want to say it was most comforting to know that a new Bricha is in the making, and that uh, Mr. Jacobson knows about it and cannot be quoted about it. And I know that a new comforting book will be in the offing, and Dr. Davis will have huh? a new challenge on his hands to either write or arrange for the organization of this book. Our warmest thanks to Mr. Jacobson. Now, he has mentioned before Rabbi Forehand, 
and he was very much surprised to see him here upstairs in my office. Now, I didn't know about this surprise uh, until a few days ago myself, and uh, I was only told by the sheerest accident by Dr. Berger, who himself figures in the saga of saving Jews considerably. I was only told by him a few days ago that uh, Rabbi Forant is in the city, lives here. Now, he was deeply and so blessedly involved in the Bricha affairs as that part of the rescue traffic in Ra. Now, uh, may I ask Rabbi Forant to rise just to be seen for a commission. Now, on this, uh, at, at this juncture, I want to uh, recognize also a great lady who is in our midst, Mrs. Charles Jordan, the widow of the unforgettable Charles Jordan, who gave his life for the Jewish people in Prague. Mrs. Jordan. While Mr. Jacobson manned uh, his, uh, the outpost in Prague of the American Joint Distribution Committee, his counterpart in Germany was another prominent staff director of the Joint, Mr. Jacob L. Trobe, whom we have the great joy to see in our midst tonight. Just look up the index of Dr. Abauer's book, and you will find those passages that telescope Mr. Trope's experiences with the Briha. And let me tell you in advance, he has quite an exciting, crisis-crowded time of it. And the reward for unending tensions and problems and for solving those problems, that reward that lies in the quiet, silent satisfaction of help rendered and uh, misery ameliorated or lessened or eliminated, this most precious, imponderable, and non-computable reward came to him also when he headed the joint mission in Italy and in Tripoli, two other big disaster areas which the war, the Holocaust, and their aftermath had created for our people. Jacob Trobe uh, proved his mettle in those critical days and months that called for and found in him a superb mastery of the moment. And one such moment followed the other moment in an unending succession of bedeviling challenges. Not that all is or can ever be quiet on Mr. Trope's front of current activities, but those stormy periods have supplied him with that, uh, I'm sure, with that big reserve of capacities that are so indispensable for him in his present post. He is now the director of the Jewish Child Care Association of New York, one of the nation's most important organizations for the care and the treatment of youngsters from broken homes with their multiplicity of emotional problems. And I have a completely uneducated guess that the current complexities of his post are mere child's play in comparison with the many-tongued turbulence that he had to cope with and had to outstandingly met some 25 or 24 years ago. And of this you can only, of course, catch a glimpse for what will be moved into bold review now, as I will call for his recollections on the Bricha, on a veteran fighter of great distinction against Jewish despair in the post-war world, on the now executive director of the Jewish Child Care Association of New York, Mr. Jacob L. Crow. <laughs> My dear friend, I had no choice but to prove my mettle, because there was no other option. And I 
can't give you your chairman when I was invited. I told him, don't ask me for a scholarly report. Don't ask me for an organized report. In fact, don't ask me for any report at all. But he was tenacious, and here I am, and pleased to be here. I um, found the ribbon today of this AJDC that I wore in the Bergen Belson in June of 1945. The rather simple ribbon attached to an American Army uniform and to a young man who had very little experience with this assignment age, I think, 34, from a small town in western Pennsylvania. Claire named Joe Namath. We always like to think it's an important town because it produced two tropes both of which served in JDC. I was very pleased that Rabbi Forehand made the usual mistake tonight. He met my brother Hillel in Prague, I guess, in 44, because we went to Europe together. And uh, it's easy to mix us up because, as I said to Rabbi Forehand, we decided early to divide the world in half. He remained abroad because he's a magnificent linguist, speaking seven languages. I, being a poor one, am stuck here, and that's why you're stuck with a second best probe thing. Now, when I, uh, I'm not, this is not going to be in any orderly fashion. I scribbled some code words. I can't deliver a manuscript because I don't see well. But I want to tell you, don't depend upon tonight's presentation, no matter how decent it is, as a substitute for this great book. It's written by a scholar. It reads. It'll make you proud of your people. There's plenty to be proud about. And I want to tell you, it's a thrilling book. And it's, it's equal to one of the finest novels. I passed to my colleague on the panel. He didn't see this. Unser Stimme. you got to remember that I had very little Yiddish. I had no Zionist background. I had absolutely no preparation for the assignment. So much so that my sister-in-law, who was very active in Adassa, thought there was a great miscarriage of justice when the Joint Distribution Committee appointed me to their staff. And maybe she was right. But at any rate, history takes me through a passage of four and a half years. It certainly enriched me, and I hope I was helpful to people. Now, this Unser Stimme has a story to it. At one point, Edward Warb uh, Joe Schwartz, who you all know, I'm sure, Dr. Schwartz, who's really one of the great Jews of our time, I said to him the other day, you know, Dr. Schwartz, uh, Joe, who's our dear friend, and he's really uh, the father of all of us, right, Gaynor? And I said to him, uh, you, uh, you're handsomely dealt with in this book, I don't know, 30 pages. I only hit two pages, I said. And that's only because I was involved in a very controversial incident which almost got my head and chopped off. But at least, Joe, in the index you'll find me right next to Harry Truman, who was a great friend of the Jews. Now they go back to Unjurstima. Uh Dr. Schwartz said to me in London one day, or in Paris, I don't remember, and he said, look, you're in Germany, and I want you to take Eddie Warburg around Germany and show him everything you've seen. So I, uh, being a rash young man and being preoccupied and really feeling guilty whenever I, I, I was already, every, when I went into Germany, every place I went, I established a base. I didn't know where to start. Moved to Belsen. I had, a, I had, at one point, I was a possessor of five different homes in Germany over the first few weeks. So, anyway, I, he said to me, uh, "Look here, 
He said, uh, show him everything, Jay. So I said, listen, I'm so preoccupied. There's so much to do. At that point, I didn't have one big mission of staff. In fact, I was alone, I think, at that moment. What do you give me a rich man's son for to just take around? He said, would it be too much to expect you to prepare the next president of the Joint Distribution Committee? So he really told me off quite properly, and that has taught me to hold my tongue. I don't hold as often as I'd like to think. When I took Eddie Warburg into Bergen-Belsen in the summer of 45, he, of course, no, no, didn't speak or understand Yiddish, and Yossler Rosenzaft, and we were not very effective at JDC then. Uh, here they had some questionable character that represented the JDC. Certainly the supplies and the services to which I think we distinguished the JDC with came later, but at that point we were pathetic. And he said, Yossler thinking the Jews all over the world were still reading and writing Yiddish and understanding Yiddish, that if Mr. Warburg, he says, if you can't give us food or if anything to improve our rations, the survivors of the Holocaust, he said, give us Yiddish typewriters so we can blast the JDC all over the world. And uh, we didn't send them the typewriters. We were, I think we may have sent typewriters. We weren't blasted, and as things went along, we moved. The other thing I remember so well, and these are only vignettes, wonderful people. Some of them, their names, I rode from memory. I had a young man, I think of Quaker, and I said, one day I uh, discovered, I didn't know much about Europe, but I discovered that Denmark was a butter, eggs, and cheese country. So I figured, well, let's get some butter, eggs, and cheese. And JDC had a, had a person up there, and I called him, and I arranged without authority, incidentally, from anybody in the JDC, to purchase a quarter of a million dollars worth of butter, eggs, and cheese. In our Paris office, we had a very, I won't mention his name, he's a very nice fellow, but he had the touch of the bureaucrat in him. And when I called him up and told him to tell the JDC office in New York to pay a certain draft for a quarter of a million dollars, he really wanted to commit me to an insane asylum. I said, don't you worry, they will pay that. They, you, all you have to do, my friend, is Send cable and that quarter million dollars because I had that faith in what the JDC wanted to do and it was absolutely true. The next problem was how do you get this over? There were no connections between Denmark and Germany by rail or anything else in those in the in those summers. And I told this young Quaker associate uh, mine go up to the frontier, the German Danish frontier, and your job is to get all that transferred from, I don't care how you do it, you get it transferred from the Danish rail cars to, and you get some German rail cars and, you know, it took some doing in those days. Well, at any rate, it was a thrilling moment when that food arrived and we all, the committee, myself and everybody else, unpacked it in Bergen Belton because the rations at that time weren't very good. So there is one vignette. Um, when um, I was in Frankfurt, Germany. No, when I came into the British zone of Germany, I headed for Bergen-Belsen, thinking that was the place to go to. I came to the headquarters of the British Army for the Rhine, and they said to me, there is no Bergen-Belsen. I mean, what do you mean there's no Bergen-Belsen? Well, there isn't. They apparently, you know, had burned down part of the camp, and they had moved and things. I said, you don't go there. They're going to send me somewhere else. So something told me to go. And I went. And I said, give me a driver. And they didn't even know who the JDC was. I came with some documents. And they weren't advanced, didn't have any advance notice. You had to talk your way through those days. And at any rate, they put uh, a young man in the, uh, in the Army, uh, a fine young man from uh, Great Britain, and he drove me in a vehicle, and I went to Bergen-Belsen, and I found 14,500 people there at that, uh, at that very night. And the British, being very proper, would not permit me. I came in late that Friday. The commander of the camp and his top staff, they were insistent that I be with them at dinner. 
And uh, in the true tradition of the British Army, they assigned me a fat boy, you know, that was a man that gave me a bowl of water and a boy to take care of me at night. So I got out. The, the, at 6 a.m. the next morning, I was out in the camp, and of course, with that little ribbon, I was just torn apart, everybody wishing to make contact with the survivors, with relatives, and everything else. Other vignettes. Um, I was in Frankfurt one day in August, I'm going to Munich in an awful hurry, and somebody says to me, the reporter for the New York Times, he's now, I believe, the UN correspondent for the Times, Drew Middleton was there, and he wanted to see me. And uh, I had very little time, and I spent no more than 10 minutes with this man. I hadn't the foggiest notion what would result from this interview. That was Saturday morning. And we think of fast communications today with satellite and everything else. But the very next day, I think my brother was in in London and told me, he'd gotten word from the United States, that the page one story in the New York Times was this interview with Drew Middleton. And what was significant about it? I said to Mr. Middleton, you know, there is no solution to the problem of the remaining Jews in Germany except the creation of a Jewish state. Now, this came from a young man, non-Zionist prepared, but it became very apparent to me. Now, that's not a new thought. As we look back, you say, what's so significant about that? Well, Mr. Milton thought, and he then went on in the story to point out that his own research corroborated that this was a solution. Well, in due course, I realized that this was a very important instrument of, you know, of forming public opinion in the United States. Um, so there was another uh, thing I was thrown into. Of course, before I went to really work, I loafed. I was sent, JDC thought they were going to have to do all their work under UNRWA. They sent me to Europe. I was going to head up all the UNRWA teams in Europe. It never quite worked out, so I was in Washington, and I was writing manuals, how to deal with welfare at the end of the war. I was assigned by UNRWA to be the chief for Poland for welfare, and I don't mean just for Jew Jews. For all of Poland, that would have been quite an assignment for me to be in Poland, but it never quite came off. I went to London away to get to Poland, and then I finally said to Dr. Schwartz, listen, if I don't have a job, I'm going to sit here in London and write manuals about welfare. You either send me home or put me aside. He said, I'll tell you what we do. All right, go to Bulgaria and Romania. So I went to, uh, now I thought I had an assignment, and I went to, uh, to uh, Cairo, and there I met Dr. Judah Magnus, and he gave me some work for a change. It was an honor to get some work, and I was that was buying medical supplies from the Middle East Command, and that was about a week or so, and I went off, and then I then a couple weeks was lost trying to get a visa to get into uh, Turkey, and then in Turkey I sat loafing for another eight weeks, not waiting for a visa to Bulgaria and Romania. I arrived in this sun, uh, in, uh, in Ankara, and I was aggressive, and I went to the Romanian ambassador, and I thought that he had the rubber stamp, and I, he was nice to me, and he thought, he thought, too, he could get me a visa, but I didn't know then, which we all know now, that the important rubber stamp was in the hands of the Soviet Union, and they weren't letting any American in there, and the joint representative of the New York Times, in fact, we had a camp practically in a hotel in Istanbul. We were all there waiting for visas. There's a cute little aside for this. Charlie Passman, who was my devoted senior colleague, uh, was very upset that I rushed to the Romanian ambassador in Ankara to get that visa, and what he found the next they thought maybe I might get there a day earlier. Well, neither of us ever got to Romania and Bulgaria at that particular time, and there was no worry about my stepping over the protocol, etc. At any rate, I tried to go back. Thing, I then That's find good. myself on the way back, and he says, now, um, this is not going to happen. I'll give you an assignment, says Dr. Schwartz, and you go Swabia. So come by way of Cairo. So I come to Cairo, and here I am. The Egyptian Gazette, the war, the war ends, an awful place to celebrate the end of World War II in Cairo. At any rate, it takes a couple weeks for the Americans to get rid of their confusion and finally tell me while well, I'm waiting for a visa, I guess 
They want me to come to Paris first before going to Yugoslavia. I can't get the Paris visa. And finally, the army man says, we well, need a Paris visa. You need an army car. You give me an army car. They're absolute chaotic. I get there and I get to Paris and Schwartz says, forget about Yugoslavia. We're going to send you someplace else. In the meantime, get down to Luxembourg. We have a problem. There I worked and there was a problem. Now we get into Germany. And as I told you, and I get into Germany, I'm in Bergen-Belsen, I make a headquarters in Frankfurt, there are four or five places. I saw very quickly what the problem was. I was held with repatriation officers. Bauer deals with the chapters in the book where, you know, you assumed if you were a Pole, you were sent back as a Pole, you know, you should go back to Poland. That was a simple-minded answer at the end of World War II. At any rate, um, the Jews weren't moving back. That's when, uh, in fact, they were coming out rather than moving back. I also remember there was no way of communicating with relatives abroad. I'll never forget taking two tremendous heavy satchels to Paris with mail across into France, and then we mailed it to the United States to relatives. I think it was the first mail that came out of Germany, other than the few things that were sent by, uh, by the American soldiers. Um, we, uh, the, uh, now we get into, we come into Italy, and in Italy I am the, I, again, I'm prepared. Do I, am I prepared for children's homes being established by political parties? This is foreign to me. But we learn. I was very much amused that I was in Italy for about 30 days, and uh, the Schlichtheim played with me carefully for the first 30 days, and one day the the, the head chef came to me and he said, we have word from, from uh, Palestine that you're to be fully trusted. And from that point on, everything went very well. Uh, the, uh, the, I told uh, the Gaynor Jacobson tonight a little vignette that I probably hadn't heard before, and that was that we went into, uh, when I came back to the United States, one day I was going, walking in Times Square and I saw around the New York Times building, what was the name of the, of the oil executive? Vogler. I see Jacobson and Vogler are imprisoned by the Hungarians. And I said to my wife, you know, I'd go to prison, go into a communist prison if they would put my name in lights around the building of the New York Times. I stood there and I saw Jacobson going around that building. The poor fellow was in jail, and he said he's here tonight, so we're all right. You know, some of the things, at one point, the, the refugees in Italy, and you know, uh, Bauer points out there's no accurate count, and there should have been any accurate count. Incidentally, my friends in UNRWA always thought I was a, a terrible person because I really never let them know when Jews were leaving is, is Well, they, and they, they, they said, Jake, there's something happening. We have a big task. And we have a kitchen staff of the refugees, and they're running the kitchen. And the next day, we got a whole new staff. They all have the same names. Come on, tell us what's going on. Of course, we didn't tell these men anything. At one point, you know, there was a lot of pressure, as you know, when Bauer deals with it, of the uh, British government, naturally, at, uh, uh, on, on Italy. And, they, they, and the Italians were pretty decent, but they were pressed very hard at certain points. And at one point, it went through all the, the camps in, in Italy and uh, great insecurity. So I, um, I went to the prime minister. I went to the foreign minister, Carlos Forza, and he said, and I said, I want the prime minister to authorize me to issue a statement where I can directly quote him and say that the, we thought them 25,000 Jews in Italy had no concern regardless of how they came across the frontier. Uh, I swore the thing, I, he, he, uh, he cooperated the foreign minister, he brought the prime minister out of the parliament, and out of the parliament came the prime minister, and I prepared a statement that's young, I had a lot of gall, I would say, but we had a statement that appeared in the press throughout Italy and was very reassuring indeed. Um, the, um, uh, now, you know, I promise you that would be an incoherent presentation, and, and I don't think I've let you down. Um, the, uh, the book deals with an incident which um, 
I, is rather complicated to discuss, but I can tell you that it was very controversial at the point. There was this General Morgan, who was the chief of UNRWA, and uh, for Germany. And there was the problem, he, I, I, I'm going to ask you to read the book, because uh, all I can tell you that when I didn't know of the book until uh, a few weeks ago, I was naturally interested in finding out how Trobe was dealt with 25 years later. And um, uh, I'm satisfied. You as a reader may not be satisfied, but I am satisfied. I want to tell you, if you don't like my role in the book, and this is a teaser, just remember it's accurate. I will not quarrel with its accuracy. Uh, it was a very interesting uh, 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 situation. Um, the uh, other things I uh, want to say to you is that um, one day in Paris, and this has, this is not directly related to the book, but you know we had to engage. You know, Mr. Jacobson here looks like a very respectable gentleman, but we aren't weren't always so respectable. We had to engage in very substantial exchange, let us say, of currency at a rate that was not the official rate. And at times the French government, the Italian government knew about this. In fact, I tried to negotiate special rates with the Italian government. And and uh, they never could figure out how to do a special rate, you know, without opening up the whole picture. And we certainly couldn't afford the official rate. There was a report, I believe, that a boat, a passenger boat came to the United States, and we got a report in Paris that I think when this boat landed, I don't know, in one of the French ports, that the French police had detained two highest men because of alleged currency transactions, as I remember. I happened to be in Paris, and we were Sunday nights, and Dr. Schwartz put on his Legion of Honor pin, which he never wore, except that night. And we started burning a lot of papers. You know, but the problem with burning some of that stuff in the, in the incinerator was smoke came out in the street and some of the papers. You know, some people probably thought we were naming a pope. But all we were doing was destroying papers that might be embarrassing. Uh, uh, now to get back one more to the Pope. Early in the day, you know there are some humorous sidelights here. Early in the days of the mission to Italy, I was uh, pressed, uh, no, I wasn't pressed, but the, you know the U.S. had, an, like they have today, Lodge as a special representative of the President to the Vatican. They had there an, uh, a special representative named by uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, Myron Tra Taylor. And he was beginning to have a problem because of that, the uh, office of uh, Pope Pius XII at the Vatican was asking him, we're getting requests from important Jews that wish to have a private audience with the Pope. Mind you, a private audience. And he said to me, now look, he says, you know, Mr. Trout, the Pope has a large flock throughout the world. He has to see his cardinals, those that are here and those that visit. He has to see leading statesmen that are accredited to the Vatican. He will see uh, an important Jew now and then, but, uh, you know, <laughs> we have to ration it. But he said to me, Myron Taylor, I don't know how to decide how to advise Vatican. So he said, would you tell me? So I always tell the, my Catholic friends that I was Pope Pius XII's uh, 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 Jewish bookie. Because I really, really, I will not tell you now, and I didn't tell them, but behind the scenes, I would say which private audience. Incidentally, we didn't think at that point, and this was long before we knew the history and the Pope Pius XII business, and we saw what was the play, the deputy was at the play. We didn't, uh, we, we just didn't think that that was the place to get, you know, tremendous justice. Now, I, uh, you can, uh, I, Am I up to my time? Yes. All right, I have. Now, let me just tell you one other thing about uh, this business of the Pope. Not only did everybody want to see him, the, few, the people that did see him, there must have been a dozen, always asked me the night before what question to ask the Pope. So I said, look, they have, they have diplomatic representation with South American countries and ask them in effect for a few visas. Nobody ever got an answer. Uh, Henry Wallace was among them. Of course, Rabbi Bernstein, I only discover in this book what Rabbi Bernstein was up to, who was the advisor on Jewish affairs, 
and he was trying to work out a plan which didn't materialize, but when he came back and met us at the Hotel Excelsior that night after his private audience, he told us he could not tell us anything, and us meant the, the, the magnificent leader of the Italian Jewish community is Raphael Cantoni, and Raphael Cantoni couldn't care less about a meeting with his holiness. I mean, and he, he's an old socialist, and poor Rabbi Bernstein got quite a calling down for wasting his time. That's the way Cantoni put it. So here we are, uh, my friends. It's nice of you to put up with me. I'm pleased to be here. You've helped me recall my memories. I have pages and pages of notes. And um, someday when uh, Gaynor Jason writes the other book, maybe I'll horn in for a return engagement. <laughs> so there you were in the midst of all these, this planned disconcertedness, this premeditated confusion. And I say premeditated. But you were, again, in the midst of it all, by Mr. Trobe's plastic and witty three-dimensional recall of men and events in all their perplexities and all their confusion. He surely has uh, thrown out not only one teaser, but quite a few of them, uh, to be followed up in the book and in uh, the return engagement, Mr. Uh, Trobe, you just so graciously promised. We are very grateful to you. And finally, Akron, Akron, Chaviv, Mr. Sam E. Block, Chaviv Vechaver, friend and colleague. Let me tell you first a few things, and he's going to squirm on his feet now for a few minutes, but I have no pity with him. Let me tell you first a few things about uh, the Sam Block of today. The director of the Jewish Agency's publication service in this very building. And Mr. Versatility in person. Versatility as the wide range of his talents goes, and versatility as the wide scope of his interests is concerned. There is this man now with the Jewish Agency for about uh, 20 year, odd years, who is a young fellow started from scratch with his bare hands, but with a brimming imagination, with an iron will and with a limitless capacity for work, what has become one of the most sparkling and spearheading instrumentalities for Jewish culture in America, who is almost a legendary pioneer of Israel's culture in this country, and Dr. Davis was very right when he once spoke of the legendary Sam Block. Yes, there is this inventive and indefatigable disseminator of Israel's books and magazines and records, the producer and the editor of the American edition of the Israel Digest. And if you haven't seen it yet, subscribe to it tomorrow at the publication service of the Jewish Agency. He's an artist of unusual accomplishment, a book designer in his own right, and a master of organization, of production and promotion, the like of whom I, for one, and many others alike, have never seen anywhere. And there is this Lithuania-born and Tarbut-bred and University of Bonn educated Sam Block, the lover and protagonist of Hebrew, a Chovet Sion in the broadest spiritual dimension, and last but not least, or better first of all, the great keeper of Jewish memory in our time, the trustee par excellence of the living remembrance of the Shoah, of the Holocaust the Secretary General of the Bergen-Belsen World Association. He is one of the founders and leaders and the initiative-driven spiritus rector for preserving and renewing the legacy of that greatest loss in our people's 
recent annals. But what interests us tonight most is Sam Brock's personal part in the history of the Bricha. This goes back to the days of his participation in the Jewish underground resistance movement in eastern Poland, to his work on the Brihaz Coordinating Committee in the city of Lodz, where he organized former partisans and soldiers for Bricha. Then came his leadership in bringing a Bricha group to the checkpoint at Stettin, previously mentioned by Mr. Jacobson, in October 1945, his arrest by the Russian military counterintelligence in Berlin, his release, his arrival in the Bergen-Belsen camp, where he became a member of the camp committee in charge of administration, supplies, and security, and his involvement, now it can be told, in the staff of Haganah in the British zone of Germany. So Sam Bluck has quite a tall story to tell. An insider story of Riha at its rawest and its most resourceful. And so it is with heightened expectations that I call now for his own memoir of the Riha on our own Sam Bluck. Continued on side three in the next cassette. an organizer in a small way, but also one of those Jews who survived Hitler's final solution and made it to Bergen Belgium, to which I will refer later. Now this is an evening of vignettes. It took Dr. Bauer about a year and a half or two years of research with a staff of people with probably a, a tremendous budget to put together all the facts. Now, what can we three people in one evening tell you about the Bricha? Just me yet. But my friends, uh, I would like to be a little serious now. In assessing, in talking about the Bricha and assessing the Bricha, we have to uh, do it, look at the Bricha as a part of what we call the heritage of the Holocaust. The Brihar movement and all these experiences are, are an inseparable part of the Holocaust and its aftermath. I'm very, very happy that Mr. Jacobson, in his presentation, mentioned the Jewish boy who fought against the Nazis in the mountains of Czechoslovakia and who was slaughtered later by the so-called Red Partisans. I shall have something to say about the question of resistance later, uh, perhaps it's not directly connected to the bar the book, but the thesis is important. The connection of Jewish conduct and Jewish behavior under the Nazis, during the Nazi regime, with their experiences and with their accomplishments and achievements and deeds, heroic deeds, after the liberation. Now, Dr. Bauer's book, in my opinion, is a wonderful uh, historical account. But what we don't find there, perhaps, in sufficient measure, is personal experiences. How the Jews went over the green borders, how they had to cross a river and the machine guns of Russian police, how they entrusted their fate to young we call them schmendrickets sometimes, young boys, 17, 18, 19 years of age, without experience, who were their leaders of these boys. And this story still has to be written. There is a, one of the books 
in Israel by Geppen de Portea Marcelin, which deals a little bit with it. There's another book, Vintivei Habricha, of Ephraim Beckel. By the way, the Hartful Press is going to uh, publish this book in English pretty soon. But it's all, only a one of the books in Israel by Geppen de Portea Marcelin, which deals a little bit with it. There's another book, Vintivei Habricha, of Ephraim Beckel. By the way, the Hartful Press is going to uh, publish this book in English pretty soon. But it's all, only a part, a small part of the story. Now, I will also try to give you a few vignettes. July 15, 1944. We were 1,300 strong out of millions, deep in the forest of Belarusia. We didn't know that there are other Jews alive. We didn't know that there are any Jews left in the concentration camps, in the death camps in Germany. We heard a little bit about the uprising in Warsaw, that everybody is dead. We thought we were the only ones, the 1300, and maybe a few in hiding here and there. And the Russian army came on July 15, 1944, and we were free. Now, this was the darkest day in then our history. You know, we lived with the uh, expectation of liberation, with the hope of life for many, many years and months. But when the actual liberation came and we started taking stock of our position, our situation, our family, it was very, very dark indeed. We had to go home now. What was our home? These 1,300 Jews in the detachment which was named after the former Russian President Kalinin, deep in the forest of Belarusia, represented maybe 5,000 or 6,000 Jewish communities that perished without a trace. So we went home and I went to my hometown. I was fortunate and lucky enough to have saved my mother and little brother with me. And in the uniform of a German soldier, he didn't have any other clothing at that time. He had to take off the uniform from the dead bodies of these German soldiers. And in all the lapidated rifle, the five bullets, that's how we came home. And we saw my, I saw my hometown again. There were no Jews in this hometown. There was a silence of death all over. Our neighbors, the Christian neighbors, the Gentiles, were afraid to talk to us. They were a small group, maybe six or seven. They looked at us like people from another planet. There were many reasons why they were afraid. You know what a sad story is. Ninety percent of them, if not more, actively collaborated with the Germans Murderers. So this is where the Bricha started, actually. Without the help of the JDC, without the budget of Jewish organizations from overseas, without even the help of the Palestinians, we had absolutely no contact at that time with Palestine or with members of the Jewish Brigade. We didn't even know what there was a Jewish Brigade in the British Army. When we started working the stones of our hometowns without Jews, we realized immediately we can't live there. It wasn't a question of ideology of the regime, whether we liked the communist the Russian regime or we didn't like it. We just couldn't endure, not even a day. And this is where the Bricha ideology, so-called Bricha ideology, the, the, the idea of, of getting away, of, of, of running and we didn't know where to start in those days. These were the days of Abakovna, from the Vilna group, and Lidovsky from Rosno, and you'll find the story in this book, independently, one from the other. Small groups started organizing in the various communities with one aim, to get out. To get out where Jews are, to bend together. This is a tremendous, powerful movement for, I would call, Jewish togetherness. And then came the May 9th, 1945. 
By the way, most of our Jewish boys did fight in the parts of your Russia were immediately sent to the front lines to be killed by the Russians. We didn't trust them. And when we had to beg for, for in some cases, to leave them in the, uh, in the community, sometimes with tears in their eyes, or the boy, one who survived out of a family of a hundred, the only survivor, the answer was that Moscow doesn't trust or believe in any tears. No mercy. So we became masters of forging documents, of inventing all kinds of supporting documents of former Polish citizenship for people to take advantage of the Russian-Polish agreement about repatriation. And that's how we got to Poland, in cattle cars, in trucks, over the border. Well, we came to Lodz. My first home in Lodz was an old, dilapidated, partly destroyed house within the confines of the Lodz ghetto. You could still see all kinds of relics of Jewish life in the ghetto at that time. But there was spirit. There I met one of my teachers from Talbot, and who told me that there was a Zionist conference in London. Yitzhak Zuckerman came back to Poland and told us that we have to get out from Poland because it's politically important that more and more Jews should be concentrated in DP camps in Germany. As a weighty political factor in the, in the struggle for Jewish state. And this is where the Bricha really started blossoming. Again, even before the arrival of the Palestinians. And as I said before, every conceivable means of forging documents, of obtaining documents, was used. We became artists, craftsmen, of making rubber stamps, of facsimiles of the signatures of the Russian commanders of various garrisons which had to be put on the so-called exit permit. Until one day, they knocked on our window in the middle of the night, and we had to run. We had to run because the, there was an informer in one of the groups going into Czechoslovakia. And I was told to escape immediately with a group of my friends to go immediately to Stettin. This was the new route over Stettin into Berlin. I was part of a group of some 32 people as a, a part of a major transport of a couple of thousand. This was one of the first to come to Berlin, to, uh, to come to Stettin. Well, there was no room for us to sleep. We slept in a kind of a barn. I had a little uh, piece of paper with the so-called parole, which was a message which I and myself did not understand because I did not know the identity of my superior. In the same way as the people who worked under me did not know my identity. Every name in the Jewish uh, uh, list of names was used. In some cases I was Chaim, and in the other case I was Moshe, and so forth, and etc. Anyway, we were met by a young man in a um, old German Junkers hat, who recognized us because we had this, our, our uh, password, and he told us that we will be put on a truck on the way to Berlin. Now, it will take me a very long, long time to tell you the right to Berlin. How we turned over with children with us, two pregnant women in the group. How we had to raise a truck with our bare hands, a five-ton Russian truck, put it back on the road. By the time we reached Berlin, it was too late to get into the, into the uh, trolley car. So the orders were to disperse and to be broken up big apartment buildings, and we had to hide in a cellar. After 10 minutes, the dogs were there, and flashlights, and Russian police. And here we are, in Berlin, 5 o'clock in the morning, on a rainy November night, beginning of November, arrested by the Russian police, and handed over to the Russian military counterintelligence, the most uh, feared uh, establishment in the Russian uh, 
set up against fascism, which was the uh, most terrible outcome. Now, the story of interrogation, you read so many books about Russian interrogation. It's also a very, very long story indeed. The Russians couldn't understand why the Jews are fleeing Poland. And they said, I was interrogated by a Russian general who was a Jewish, wearing those green epaulets. And he said, look, you seem to be an uh, intelligent young man, and you remember the regime of these pre-war uh, Polish anti-Semites. Anti we saved you once in 1939, when you occupied this part of Poland, from the Polish anti-Semites. We saved you a second time from, the, from, the, uh, from Hitler, from the Nazis. Now, this is how you're paying us back, you're running away from us. These people didn't want to understand that we couldn't live anymore in the same street where so much Jewish blood was spilled. That every cornerstone reminded us of fathers and mothers and children and wives and husbands, etc. So, by some mysterious, in some mysterious way, we managed to get in touch with the Bircha people while sitting in Berlin in Weissensee in the cellar to get in touch with the Bircha people in the Ronnie synagogue who in turn went to the JDC people and the JDC people went to Eisenhower and Eisenhower went to Zhukov and on December 31st we were free. We were free to come into Berlin, into the Berlin transit camp. But this was only a transit camp. Our destination was Berlin, Belgium. Practically on foot, we made the, the road from Berlin over pra uh, Brandenburg into Helsen under machine gun fire in the middle of the night, in the darkness of the night, crossing the border, led by a German guy who was, who was working with the Bricha, was get, getting paid by them until we were arrested by the British, and the British brought us to Bergen-Belsen. Now, Bergen-Belsen became our first home. Uh, I came into Bergen-Belsen, as I said, at the end of 1945. Mr. Straub wasn't there any longer. There were other people. We shall never forget some of the good deeds and the friendship of all these shlichim from Jewish communities from other countries. But what we must point out in the connection of Bihar. I don't think that Bauer himself does it so.